to resume recording. Um, so hello everyone, welcome to today's uh, six research seminar. I'm a Simon Wakeling, a lecturer here in the School of uh, Information and Communication Studies and hosting the session on behalf of the school's research committee. Um, thank you everyone for attending, lovely to see so many people from all across the university. I'll begin by acknowledging the Waradri, Gunawal, Gundagara and Birupai peoples of Australia, who are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which CSU's campuses are located and pay respects to their elders, both past and present. So as I just mentioned, this session is being recorded and eventually there'll be a, a link to the recording um, from on the school website once we get that page of the website sorted out, which will be the next couple of weeks. Um, it is helpful for us to keep a record of who's attending. So um, if you could type in just a very quick intro into the chat and, and let us know who you are and, and where you're from, that would be great. Um, the format as usual will be around a, a 40 to 45 minute presentation. So plenty of time at the end questions feel free to put questions that you have as we go into the chat and I'll keep an eye on those and collate them uh, to put to David uh, at the end. So today's seminar is called Playable Archives Exploring the Literary Canon Through Games and Drama and our presenter is uh, Dr David Cameron. Uh, David's an adjunct senior lecturer in the School of Information and Communication Studies. Uh, his professional background includes radio broadcasting, journalism uh, and online media production. He's previously been chief investigator on an ARC linkage grant developing game-based public affairs simulations for the Australian Defence Force uh, and his PhD examined shared conventions between role based and game based learning. So that's quite enough of me. Without any further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to you, David. Thanks, Simon, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So let me just uh, share some screenage for you. And um, I happen to be uh, on a Wabakal land uh, today. So I'm in Newcastle today. So just to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the area where I happen to be. Um, also, if you hear a little bit of work going on in the background, that's the view from my window this morning. So um, not quite some builder crack there, but close. Um, <laughs> digging up the driveway this morning. So uh, actually, actual jackhammers. So uh, it's not a sound effect. So if you hear a bit of noise in the background, my apologies, but uh, now you can see why. So it takes away the mystery, I guess, as to what's going on. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about, um, going to talk about a specific project called Playing Beowulf, and we'll get to that uh, in due course. Um, just a little sense, I guess, of how I got to that position or how I ended up working in that project, um, a little bit of my, uh, personal engagement with this area, if you like, which is a combination, I think, of video game or game-based learning. So that use of uh, games and game technology for educational purposes. Um, parallel to that was some work that I was doing or um, some research work, etc., uh, around drama, but a, a particular type of drama uh, focused again on the educational side. So the application of drama and drama conventions for education. So not, not so much drama as, uh, as in the theatrical sense, um, putting on plays, et cetera, but in the application of dramatic conventions for uh, educational purposes. Um, so where those elements came together for me, we're in a a couple of projects. So you can see um, it's almost ancient history now, going back to 2001. I'm surprised I can even remember it. Um, probably one of the main um, starting points for me personally. Now, my background was journalism. Um, so I was teaching in the School of Communication at the time uh, as, a, as a journalism uh, lecturer primarily. Um, but I was interested in video games and um, uh, drama for educational purposes, particularly role, role play, role based um, education. Became involved uh, with a theatre media colleague, um, uh, Professor John Carroll, who was doing a project in the Netherlands with uh, Dutch school children and Dutch drama students, so tertiary drama students, um, which was a project uh, that engaged uh, the students in class in some role based work 
but also looking at some interactive um, online stuff. And they did this great project about the Batavia shipwreck, which was a shipwreck off the coast of West Australia uh, in the 1600s, where um, you know, there's a whole bunch of survivors, but they kind of went crazy or half of them went crazy. And it's this really wild story, but it's if you want to engage um, school children, just drag out stories of murder and mayhem stuck on a desert island, fantastic project. Um, that led to me being interested in thinking about how do you take these things like uh, you know, game-based um, learning, uh, role-based drama, and how might I use them in my work uh, when I was teaching journalism? So I did a project uh, for my MA Honours, uh, designed a kind of simulation around a flood, uh, a town that gets flooded, uh, and used that with uh, journalism students both on campus and uh, DE um, as part of that um, education uh it's part of their learning um this kind of all came together i guess guess the work that i'd done with john and my own work and uh some of the other work that was going on in um uh it at csu at the time around 2006 we got an a arc linkage grant with the um defense force australian defense force it was actually the the, the defense simulation office were our partner so as you can imagine that's the part of the defense force that develops um, all kinds of simulations for training. Um, but we were working with the public affairs unit, so the kind of the PR unit, if you like, of the Defence Force, um, and developing, uh, again, kind of game-based and role-based, drama-based um, approaches to their training. Um, so that continued my interest in that. Uh, wound up myself doing a uh, visiting fellowship to the University College London Knowledge Lab in about 2014. Um, and they were working on this project that became playing Beowulf, but they'd been working on uh, software to enable people to um, fairly quickly design their own 3D uh, computer games. And so a little bit of a sense, I guess, of that um, as some background. So the software that they developed was called Mission Maker. Um, and primarily it had been developed uh, through, as I said, the UCL Knowledge Lab, which is part of the Institute of Education at uh, University College London, um, led largely by Professor Andrew Byrne. Andrew is uh, their professor of English literature, really, and media. Um, so his background is really as a, an English drama teacher, but of course, um, uh, you know, that has extended now into uh, looking at, at media and now games. And so Andrew had been working for quite a long time with colleagues uh, at UCL on this project to develop uh, software that would enable people to, to quickly make their own uh, video games without having to be coders. So it wasn't about the coding side per se of making video games, but it was about using video games as a tool to explore um, other stories perhaps. Uh, and as it turned out to explore classic literature like Shakespeare, uh, and as we'll see, um, Beowulf. So it did started in about 2003. Um, they'd run some projects looking at using it to develop games around Shakespearean plays. I think they started with The Tempest uh, and then moved on to um, Macbeth. Um, again, Macbeth, great play to do, lots of ghosts, lots of killing, lots of witches. Uh, you know, you can see how it lends itself to, um, uh, to have perhaps being a video game. Um, and then, they did work with the British Library around uh, Beowulf uh, and then have come back to Macbeth. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit about uh, the uh, playing Beowulf side of things. Actually, what I'll do first, I think maybe to give you a sense of um, how Mission Maker works. So I'll just give you a quick look at uh, the software in operation. Now, I, I won't risk doing a live demo of the software, but I will risk uh, perhaps just playing some, um, some captured caption video so it's you know it's not it's not the most um elegant shall we say of, of game interfaces but it works um, and in fact when you're working with young people they kind of look past a lot of the some of the clunkiness or the uh the rough edges and um they really just jump straight into being able to make games now this is this is the version that is kind of uh the mission maker macbeth version it's identical really to the one um used with the beowulf text um so it includes a lot of the same characters so it's, it's really simple so you can see here you can build up a game world with this map view so there's lots of pre um pre-constructed templates of 
of rooms and environments. Um, so once you drop them in, you can simply go into this kind of uh, 3D first person perspective game. You know, it's a bit rough and ready, I guess, compared to the kind of AAA blockbuster game titles that you'd go down to um, the game store and buy today. But it's um, it works. And of course, when when young people are uh, building the worlds themselves, they get totally immersed in it pretty much straight away. Um, so you can choose all kinds of uh, characters to drop into the game world um, just through the menu interface. So you, you tend to work between um, going into this 3D world view to place objects to um, set where different characters will be. So here you can see the um, process of dropping in some props. Um, there's a whole kind of library of, of um, artifacts that you can put in. Uh, you can see here, because we're doing the Macbeth version, there's all the, the bit, there's a bat, Tracy. We had a, <laughs> you, you showed us your, um, your knitted bat at the start while we were waiting to start the presentation. Here's, a, here's an avatar bat, digital bat. So these are the ingredients for the witch's uh, cauldron, for example. So in this case, um, we could be designing a game level where the player has to go around and find all the ingredients uh, for the witch's brew, perhaps to, um, you know, to call up uh, Hecate and cast incantations and, and all that kind of stuff. You can bring in um, other bits of media, um, text, uh, pop-ups on the screen, etc. So um, young people in particular just take to it fairly quickly. Um, you know, I guess that they engage with games a lot as players, but a lot of them do um, tinker, mod, um, or at least can um, you know, come to grips with the tools fairly quickly. You can build in the gamey side of things fairly quickly too. So setting um, kind of, these are trigger volumes that we're playing with here. They enable you to make interactive elements. So when a player's character passes through that space in the game, um, you can add in certain rules as to what happens. Uh, you have these kind of uh, rule conditions that you can set for characters, for objects, for the environment itself. Um, do things play? Do things start to chase you? Do they become part of your backpack? Uh, all these kinds of things that you would expect from a fairly typical uh, computer game environment. So in this case, uh, you know, putting in the prophecy, um, we can drop in characters. So uh, maybe we wanted to make a game around um, uh, Macbeth's interactions uh, with uh, Banquo. Um, Benquo, of course, becomes uh, a ghost character later in the play. Comes back to um, comes back to haunt Macbeth, etc. So you could you could um, uh, not only can the the participants, the young people, make their kind of game levels, but you can also introduce them to this sense of coding in rules. So um, lo the logic of games, uh, how the economy of games work, um, scores, uh, health those kinds of things. Um, so you can see that can go in and, and build up a, a reasonable um, sort of game environment. Probably gives you a pretty good sense of how it works. <laughs> Just, uh, it's probably the main, that's given you a sense of it. So you can, there's combat in there. So here's, uh, this could be uh, Macbeth and Macduff having a bit of biff at the end. Uh, quite, you can have all kinds of bloodthirsty things. You can add in um, recorded voice, um, sound effects, those kinds of things. Here's the sequence, you know, if you remember the play Macbeth, you know, the, um, is this a dagger which I see before me? So here the, the um, designer's designing a part of the game where the uh, ghostly dagger is going to appear to the player. Um, it'll re-engage them with that bit of the text. And uh, obviously, you know, they can pick up the dagger and, and uh, go and kill the king as part of the game level, et cetera. So that gives you a little sense, I hope, of, of that interface. Um, so it's, you know, as I said, if, you, if you're into games uh, and things yourself, you probably um, get a sense of how that would work to build up uh, that 3D environment. So that's the Macbeth, Macbeth version. So before that, there was a version designed um, specifically for the text Beowulf. So this was in 2015. Um, this was a collaborative project largely between uh, University College London, so with the Knowledge Lab, essentially, 
and the British Library. So if you kind of know where the British Library is in London, so it sort of sits between Euston and um, St Pancras uh, railway stations, King's Cross, the Knowledge Lab or the, the Institute of Education is not far from there. So it's kind of, they're kind of really nicely geographically located for this type of collaboration. Um, the British Library also has quite a, um, an interesting and advanced uh, unit that is engaged with uh, looking for innovative ways to um, bring the collection to life through, um, through educational programs and, and also through digital programs. And so they were very interested in a, in a project that would um, engage people with different texts through video games and um, performance drama, media, et cetera. So they, they were um, very interested. Overall, these projects were about engaging young people with these types of texts. So with Beowulf, which is a classic uh, Anglo-Saxon text uh, and uh, Shakespeare, et cetera, the types of canonical texts that the British Library, of course, um, holds copies of. Um, so engaging young people with those texts, but engaging them through um, the, their own media cultures. And so things like games, for example, uh, made sense as a platform to explore uh, these types of texts. And it certainly wasn't just about adaptation. So it wasn't about taking the text as is and just kind of recreating scenes from Macbeth or moments from uh, Beowulf or any other text and just kind of trying to replicate that um, as a game. It was about exploration and um, possibly even transformation of those texts or narratives. Um, and fairly consistently through various um, iterations of this project um, or workshops attached to the project, what you would see um, is the students and the participants um, finding dramatic or playful or game-like narratives within those texts and uh, extrapolating those out and turning them into game sequences or levels or challenges uh, within games. Um, or finding gaps in the texts and exploring the kind of what if, what happened to this character? Um, what if this had become a, a major scene? And so, for example, uh, maybe to use Macbeth as an example, it might be a bit more familiar. Um, there's a scene in Macbeth where um, his, he sends assassins essentially to kill uh, the family of his rival Macduff. And so in the, in the play, the murderers arrive and... Uh, they kill, um, uh, you know, Lady Mac Macduff and uh, and her children. Um, we assume it kind of it happens off stage, and so it's uh, you know conveniently in the theatre. It's always more convenient to kill people off stage because then you don't have to drag the body off off stage. So in a classic kind of theatrical moment, Lady Macduff, you know, exits, uh, chased by the murderers, and you kind of assume that she's. Um, She's murdered there and then, and I think there's a reference to it later in the play. But, um, for example, in one of the workshops, the students decided to go, well, what happens? What happens off, off stage? Um, is Lady Macduff uh, murdered or, or does she turn into a kind of, uh, you know, um, a game character and fight back? And so they, de they designed a, a, uh, a game level where you, you would play Lady Macduff uh, trying to evade the uh, murderers and being able to fight back in the murderers. So, yeah, there's a kind of gap in the text there that um, uh, taking a game-like, a video game-like approach enables the, the um, participants, particularly in this case, um, it, that was um, kind of year 10 students, uh, enables them to explore the text from, from all kinds of interesting ways. But as I said, it wasn't just about adapting the text, it was uh, about this sense of exploring and transforming finding the gaps as much as finding what was in the text itself. Um, so, you know, a really interesting approach. Um, if you're not fam so familiar with uh, Beowulf, so Beowulf is a, uh, an Anglo-Saxon poem. Um, it's, its origins are a little bit obscure. Um, we have, uh, well, the British Library has uh, a, a copy of it, a manuscript of it from probably about the 10th century, a, a kind of medieval um, uh, copy of it, transcription of it, um, written in sort of Old English, Anglo-Saxon. Um, it's an epic poem. Um, there's a translation there you can see on screen and uh, sort of the opening page of it um, there on the right. Um, interestingly, and um, it was one of the 
first texts, I think, that the British Library went um, kind of full digital with. They did a big project, I think, with the University of Kentucky and, and made kind of the, the digital Beowulf um, as one of their early experiments in not just digitising the archive, but in turning it into a kind of searchable text with um, transcriptions and, and, all, and tools that you can use to research it. So that's partly why they were interested in looking at Beowulf uh, for this project, um, because it already had a history, I guess, of, of that digital um, exploration. Um, and also it just kind of lends itself to, uh, to games, I think. Um, if, you, if you're not so familiar with Beowulf itself, um, and uh, actually just let me... Um, uh, you know, it, when you kind of look at old, old English text on the screen, it kind of doesn't mean anything to us, but hopefully just have a little listen. This is uh, an Anglo-Saxon scholar um, just reading out essentially that passage that you can see on the screen. So um, hopefully you'll hear it. What? We gardena in yer dagum theu kuninga thrum yu thrunon, hu tha adelingas ellen fremedon, Oft sil shiving shearden a threat o monig a maith om meud o setla of tear hey for the arras. There we go. So we're all ready to go off to the mead hall now. We're all enthused. Um, so it's that kind of epic, uh, epic poem. You know, it's designed in a way for for live performance. We might be more familiar with Beowulf. So there's been movies of Beowulf. There was one a few years ago, Angelina Jolie and um, uh, other famous names in it. We would be familiar with the kind of tone, the characters, the vibe of it, I guess, from um, texts like uh, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings. Tolkien, of course, was an Anglo-Saxon scholar. Um, so he was quite familiar with Beowulf uh, when writing uh, Lord of the Rings, etc. So you can see that influence in there. Um, and even in modern games like Skyrim, you see, you know, the, the kind of characters, the the uh, the layout, the scenery, you know, dragons, anything that's got a dragon in it, uh, got to be good for a game. So certainly um, the text itself lends itself well to, um, uh, to turning into a game, to exploring with a game. If you, if you don't know much about Beowulf, don't worry, you're in good company. Um, these were some comments uh, from participants in the um, Australian workshop attached to that project, which I'm going to tell you about. Um, so, you know, we asked them about what they knew about um, Beowulf before they started. And so, you know, ah, it's a Norse story about some bloke who slays a dragon. Well, that's, you know, good. Um, I knew that Tolkien wrote a version. So, you know, you get that sense. Some were aware of the connection with um, Lord of the Rings. Um, others had no idea what Beowulf was. So if you hadn't really heard of Beowulf or you weren't so familiar with it, um, don't worry. Um, but you may have come across some of the cultural references that, that stem from Beowulf, and which is why it's considered a canonical text. So um, the Playing Beowulf project had a number of workshops attached to it. Some were in the UK, most were in the UK. Some involved um, Anglo-Saxon like medieval studies students at UCL. Some involved uh, students from schools around that area. Um, some involved uh, drama students doing some drama workshops around um, how you teach Beowulf and how you might engage the game software as part of that process. Um, here in Australia, we ran a project. Um, I was working at the University of Newcastle at the time uh, I had colleagues uh, at the University of Sydney. Uh, we did a project at the University of Sydney, partly because not only did they have money, um, but partly because they had an Anglo-Saxon um, scholar um, who could help us with uh, that part of the process. So could come and talk to the students about Beowulf um, and could even read Anglo-Saxon much better than, than we could. Um, it was run in conjunction with Australian Theatre for Young People. So they ran it as a kind of school holiday project um, and students uh, basically signed up, uh, parents paid money for them to come along. Um, and we also brought in a, uh, a puppeteer, uh, a guy called Phil Ralph, who is actually a Charles Sturt graduate. Um, actually quite a few Charles Sturt connections into the project. Um, the director of Australian Theatre for Young People is a Charles Sturt graduate. 
uh, Phil the puppeteer is a Charles Sturt graduate and another Phil um, who worked with us on the media side uh, works at Sydney Uni. He's also a Charles Sturt graduate, so there you go. Um, so I'll talk you through um, these aspects of it to give you a sense of how the workshop worked. Um, and you'll see what it is, is a combination of not just the game, so we used the game software, but we also incorporated um, puppetry um, and a lot of media production stuff, and it culminated in a live performance that incorporated the puppets, a um, bit of drama, performance, improvised performance from, from the kids themselves. Uh, and they also incorporated uh, through audio visual presentation, uh, some of their game development work as well. So it's essentially um, is uh, I'll roll the video. It's just kind of a slideshow and I'll talk to it as we go. So um, I'll just skip this bit because you've already seen their kind of introductory comments. So the first part of it was really, as you would expect, engaging um, folk with what the story of Beowulf is. And so there you can see Daniel, um, leading the session. He's the Anglo-Saxon scholar and he loved it. So one interesting out, outcome of the project was bringing all these different um, people together from different disciplines. So, you know, media, um, drama, teacher education, um, and in this case, a medieval scholar. And so talking the students through what the story is, they, you know, very, um, I love this kind of he this is this is kind of a summary of the uh, there's kind of three good bits three good game bits if you like good fight bits in um, in Beowulf there's one bit you may have heard the monster Grendel so Grendel terrorizes um, terrorizes the mead hall so basically comes to the pub every night and picks a fight um, carries people off to his lair um, so they hire in some mercenaries some from some Norsemen who sail down to uh, take on Grendel so Fighting Grendel is one um, aspect of the story. Then there's uh, Grendel's mother who gets a little bit upset with the fact that they take uh, lock off Grendel's head. Um, and so there's another fight. This is, that, that was the character played by Angelina uh, Jolie in the movie. Uh, you might remember that scene. So um, there's a fight with Grendel's mother. And then there's this whole kind of bunch of stuff in the middle about um, uh, you know, um, various movements of people and sailing here, sailing there. And then you get an old Beowulf at the end who, who fights a dragon. So it's got these great elements in there um, that you can uh, pull out really, that the kids could pull out to turn into games and explore through um, performance and drama. Um, the classic part of it is, uh, of, of the fight is um, Grendel gets his arm ripped off. Um, so you, there you can see uh, conveniently there's a, there's a puppet arm for them to play with. Um, working their way through the story, getting a sense of what it's all about, um, designing some of the media and things that they would want to do with it, playing with a dragon. I mean, wow, fantastic. And then they started to rehearse uh, a little bit of stuff about pulling Grendel's arm off. So they're doing, you know, some very quick shadow um, theatre work. Fashion a dragon, there you go. Um, so, you know, stage one, getting to know the, uh, getting to know the story. Now in all the workshops um, for this project, whether they were entirely game-based or included the um, drama element, that was always a consistent part of it, was introducing um, the participants to what the story was um, and helping them find where the games might come from. So what parts of that story uh, might lend themselves to games. And it didn't matter whether it was Beowulf or um, Macbeth, um, you, you would take that same approach. Um, in this case, as I said, we had the advantage, there's some dodgy character with Grendel's head. Um, we had the advantage of um, having a puppeteer. Um, and so that brought a whole kind of nice physical dimension to the work that they were doing. But it also connected the students, I think, to the world, the 3D world of the game. So being able to build puppets themselves and manipulate them, understand how they're articulated, um, how you tell stories with the puppets. Um, you could see it come through in the language and the discussions that they would have when they were building the games because they had this great sense of having worked with physical representations of um, objects in the story that they could manipulate, going into the virtual world and, and dealing with um, the 3D models, et cetera. I think it just really helped them make that connection. 
Um, and it really helped them make the connection between the, the physical and the virtual when they started to design their performances as well. So they had a kind of almost um, porous understanding of the story through whether it was the physical medium of puppets and performance or whether it was the virtual medium of the media or the, um, the game elements. You know, to them, it was all one of, it was all part of the toolkit that they could use um, to explore the, explore the story, which was really interesting. Um, just conscious of the time. So I'll just skim a little bit through the construction. I mean, a bit rough and ready. It was all done in basically a day building the puppet. Um, and then of course they got to rehearse. Uh, when you're ready. Let's rehearse a fight scene. So you can tell, um, incidentally, if, you, if you're in the wild trying to spot, uh, you know, a wild Grendel, um, that's a Grendel. Um, and uh, there's Grendel's arm, pops out. Uh, that's Grendel's mother. And you can tell the difference because Grendel's mother has a wig, right? So that, that's how you spot the difference. Um, highly, highly detailed. We didn't make two puppets. We um, threw it through that lovely, delightful wig onto Grendel and instantly you have Grendel's mother. So there you go. Um, so there's Grendel's mother having a fight um, and the dragon puppet, of course. So I think. Uh, might see a bit of rehearsal with that. Here we go. We'll just see a little bit of that. Um, so again, you know, really fairly rapidly built these puppets, but um, and they made their own um, sort of little maquettes as well of, of, of characters as well. Okay, so the games and media side. So I'm not so having played with that, that side of things. So they, they got their hands on Mission Maker. It took probably five seconds for them to understand um, how it worked, um, as is often the case. You know, by the time they, they'd logged in, they were off and running. Um, in fact, getting them to log in probably took the longest of setting up the workshop and then um, trying to corral them out of the lab to go and do something else in the workshop was then probably the hardest part. So you can see that they're, they're all just working away in Mission Maker. Um, this is probably, I think this is about the first afternoon. So in the morning, they'd, they'd uh, heard about the story. They had done some puppet work. Um, and now they're in there building different levels in the game. And you get all kinds of different variations. So as I said, um, it wasn't about adapting the story um, and turning it into a kind of just a, a straight version of Beowulf. It was about the students um, you know, thinking of, of what are the game-like elements of the narrative or what could I do um, uh, with these characters and this world to create um, stories and, and interactive um, elements of it. Uh, it came up, they came up with all kinds of things. So one was just this straight kind of um, treasure hunt, you know, get as much treasure as you could. Um, others got quite complex uh, narratives. This one was about, this one was a game of how many um, avatars can I put in one space for you to fight in, you know, 20 seconds. Um, one was a kind of uh, chase sequence. So they, they, they just built this entire labyrinth of pipes that you had to run through. Um, and the other thing that they did was build uh, kind of sets and really just record them so that they could use these as backdrops in their live performance as well. So, and then they wanted to bring in the puppets into green screen um, and, and bring their puppets if they could. They, want, they really wanted to bring their puppets into the game world. Um, so just, you know, the way that their thought processes were operating, as I said, it's that porous um, nature between the physical and the virtual was really interesting and really came to the fore when you're working with, um, when you're working with these young people and letting them sort of have free range. And so, there you go. So they've even brought in some sound effects. So again, a bit rough and ready and maybe using a green puppet against green screen was not the, the brightest of technical um, ideas. But um, you can see that they've, they've brought the puppet and they kind of arranged all this themselves. Like we facilitated it, but they kind of called the shots and told us what they wanted to do. Um, and so they, they brought the puppet into, the, into a game space and created um, various narratives around that. Um, and they also did uh, readings of different parts of the text that they, they wanted to explore that for themselves using the translation, mind you, not the original uh, Anglo-Saxon, but um, so they engaged with the, the voice acting work as well. 
Um, and we asked them, you know, what, why they'd signed up. And I guess not surprisingly, being a, um, a theatre for young people activity, the performance is what had attracted them um, uh, primarily. But um, we did ask them at the end, you know, what they'd enjoyed. And of course, the, the game stuff uh, and the video came to the fore a little bit more. Um, and just to, to kind of conclude this bit, uh, so it did culminate in a um, performance that they put together, um, essentially for their parents. It was improvised, it was rough and ready. They had about an afternoon, you know, a couple of hours to prepare it. Um, but they, you know, pulled it all together. They, they storyboarded, they mind mapped things that they could do. Um, luckily at Sydney Uni in the old teachers college, um, we had the kind of equivalent of an old uh, Anglo-Saxon mead hall to put the performance in. Um, it looked kind of like one of the levels in the game, which was kind of funny. Um, and they kind of, they threw it together, you know, so they experimented with, um, they wanted to use a screen. So they turned it into a sail as part of their ship when they sailed and they uh, developed all the fight scenes. Um, of course, you had to get the puppet in there. Um, that's Grendel, we can tell, and that's Grendel's mother, note, note the wig. Um, so fight scenes, I'll show you a little bit of that. So live performance, um, this is mobile phone footage. So filmed in um, low def, um, but, uh, you know, a sense of performing for their parents. And of course the parents loved it. The parents, you know, of course are watching it through their mobile phone screens as you do, um, sending it up to Insta and, you know, letting Nen watch live and all that kind of stuff. I think it was streamed live. Um, final scene with the, the dragon, he's old Beowulf, Beowulf the old man, final fight. Um, comes off the worst for wear. There's, there's Beowulf's funeral at the end. Uh, and of course, to the spoils go the victor. So uh, carrying off the head of Grendel as a souvenir um, at the end. So, um, so that's that workshop, right? So um, that was part of uh, the process. Just to wrap up, I guess, with, um, I know it's a little bit of just a, a description, perhaps more than getting deeply into the, into the research themselves. And I can certainly give you some, um, some references if you want to go um, and read, read that uh, written up. We were interested, though, in, in where it might lead in this, in this sense of developing a, a playable game-like approach to our cultural institutions, so to our libraries and our galleries and our, our museums. Um, and as a starting point, you know, we'd been interested in um, John Hartley's um, thinking about the shift, um, how our approach to cultural institutions and their own relationships with their contents um, has changed over time. So that sort of classic um, early museum approach, the modern archive, as Hartley calls it, where it was all about the physical objects. Um, and we'd go to them and we would observe the real, you know, the one-off um, or the rare um, part of the collection. It was very physical. Um, Hartley has this sense of, you know, then we move into this postmodern phase, and a lot of it is to do with archives of our mass media, so particularly television. Um, that sense of moving from visitors to being audiences, uh, the mediation of a lot of our culture and how um, there are archives now that are kind of built around our media um, content uh, as much as anything else. And the way that existing archives also have to cater, if you like, for that, um, for that audience or for that format of engagement as well. Um, Hartley had this idea of networked archives, which is the kind of... Um, archives of content that's being produced online. Um, it's searchable. There's a kind of uncertainty probability about what you might encounter in these archives. Um, who owns different things? Is it verifiable? Is it, is it an original copy? Is it a copy of a copy of a copy? All these kinds of things. Um, but this sense of our relationship becoming more co-creative. Um, we're more users, if you like, of, of the content. So moving from visitors and audiences to being co-creators, uh, being users. And we were interested in uh, a more playable approach. So, um, you know, this sense of moving beyond just um, uh, either the physical objects or the digitized objects that exist in, uh, in the archives and designing ways of engaging with them that are more open-ended, more playful, um, the outputs of those experiences and engagements could in turn feed back into um, archives as new or, or kind of transformed um, objects in themselves. 
as well. So you start to see um, genuine co-creation. Um, and, and recognizing that uh, a lot of our cultural institutions, so in the glam sector, you know, there has been um, a kind of performative turn, if you like, in more recent years, recognizing that um, uh, exhibition and interpretation is, is a kind of theatrical process in many ways, but that we do deal with the symbolic um, representation of, of these things in many ways. It's not just about the literal um, objective representation. Um, and I think I like this sort of uh, recognition from um, Sue Bennett as well, that in a lot of our cities, theatres and museums do tend to physically occupy, this, occupy the same kinds of precincts. You know, they're, they're, you get the kind of performance theatre venues and, and um, often some of our cultural institutions like museums and libraries are co-located, um, particularly, um, you know, in central business districts and things. Uh, so there's good opportunities for this kind of crossover. Um, and this sort of double existence or double life that our cultural institutions have, you know, um, particularly museums, if you think about them, they, they do feature in our in, in, um, uh, creative works um, because they are so, uh, they are so provocative uh, in, their, in their own right, you know, because of this nature of, of dealing with stories and dealing with time and um, dealing with journeys through them and experiences. And so they were really interesting um, point to start when you want to start thinking about storytelling and reimagining the stories that they hold, um, the archives themselves or the museums and collections themselves are also very kind of um, inspirational, imaginary spaces uh, as much as they are real spaces. And so you get this, this double existence. And we certainly saw that with um, the work of the British Library, you know, working with both playing Macbeth and playing um, Beowulf um, you know, that those spaces themselves uh, have this kind of um, quality about them, physical quality that lends themselves to uh, pr provoking imaginative responses. Um, so this sense of, you know, this transformation from, from being visitors to these institutions, becoming audiences, maybe users and co-creators, towards being players. So playing with the content, exploring the content through play, um, coming up with more game-like, role-based, um, drama-like, performative engagements, and in turn, how that feeds back into um, these archives in their own collections, I guess, in their own engagements with, um, uh, with their different um, users, different audiences, et cetera. And I think that's kind of me. I'll, I'll wrap it up there. And um, if folks do have some questions, ready to, ready to fire. Thanks very much, David. There haven't been any questions in the chat so far, but I'm sure there are some questions from the audience so far away. Or not. David, it's Michelle. Howdy. Howdy. Um, while you were talking about that, um, you know, interaction with storytelling I kind of thought about Brunzer's notion of the producer and so kind of do you see these um, examples sitting in that um, that understanding or you know of um, the audience kind of transitioning from audience to um, content creator and that notion of the producer yeah and I think that was one of the underlying um, rationales for um, certainly for both the Beowulf and the Macbeth projects was to um, help young people engage with what are otherwise things that are hidden away behind glass, you know, like security glass, security systems. If you go and you can go and see the, that text of Beowulf and you can go and see examples of um, Shakespeare's first folio as physical objects, you can go and see them on display, but you can't get anywhere near them as physical objects. Um, and to some extent, if you're thinking particularly about younger people um, at school, they're also kind of impenetrable as texts of the imagination. Like we couldn't, we can't just pick up the Anglo-Saxon text of, of Beowulf and read it and understand it. Um, even scholars don't really understand it. Uh, they make a lot of guesses about what, what it's saying. Um, and you could say the same with Shakespeare to an extent as well, uh, particularly, you know, engaging younger audiences with it. Um, it's the classic, that's why they're sort of classic texts. 
Um, and so getting them to engage with making stuff based on those texts, but not, but not recreating the texts, not, not trying to get to the level of understanding of being able to go, okay, we're gonna put on a play. We're, we're gonna stage the play of Macbeth. Um, that's something else. It was more about getting enough of, a, of, enough, of enough of an understanding of game-like bits or gaps in the text that they wanted to explore um, and saying, you can be a producer. You're not just a user or consumer of these texts, even though they're centuries old. Um, uh, you, can, you can do something new with it. You can interpret it in a new way. You can become part of that storytelling continuum, if you like. And I guess the interesting thing about thinking about the archives themselves as, as kind of cultural keepers of these objects, um, they can extend that role, if you like, to the content that people then produce in response. And so, because it's digital content, um, largely or mediated in some way in, in um, many of these projects, those archives can, can in turn become um, enhanced or extended around those texts with the stuff that people produce. And it's not just about having a, um, you know, a, a Flickr page where people can share their pictures of, endless pictures of the same, a copy of Beowulf under glass case, but actually share game levels and uh, movies and um, those kinds of things, Michelle. So yeah, I mean, that idea of the producer, uh, a sort of hybrid producer user, um, yes, but also the way that it, it kind of ex extends into the archives themselves and builds their collections potentially um, with new content uh, around, the, around the same texts. Yeah, so interesting. Thanks. There's a question from Tracy in the chat. Can you elaborate on the physical performance and material objects feeding into the virtual and also back the other way? Yeah, so I think you saw um, hopefully there in that example from the Sydney workshop, um, Tracy, as I said, uh, we didn't start the students working on the virtual. So even though you know, we could have leapt straight into let's go make game levels, um, obviously, had to engage them with the story, um, first of all, but then got them making stuff and, and performing with stuff first so that they understood um, a kind of embodied approach to the story first, a physical way of engaging with the puppets, how the puppets worked, um, but also how to tell stories in a physical way, in an embodied way, even if it was just kind of improvised shadow puppetry, bashing each other with a, an arm, you know, chasing each other with a dragon and then going into the vir virtual world. Um, and I think it, I think it did help. Uh, we, we sort of noticed a, a difference in the language and the descriptions that our participants um, engaged with when they were describing their game levels. They did refer back to uh, the physical stuff that they had done. Whereas in the other workshops, say in the UK, it was all about the game level that was kind of their their focus and it was about the rules and the logic of their games. And so they didn't have that same connection. Um, coming back the other way, as I said, it was with our lot, it was quite porous because they wanted to find ways um, to bring the game into their live performance. Um, unfortunately, of course, you tend to be stuck with projection, um, you know, so, um, particularly with the resources that we had, although you could, you could imagine, um, you know, finding ways to do it in a more kind of um, augmented reality way or a virtual reality way and kind of combine them a, a little bit more as an experience for the audience, I guess. But they really wanted to take stuff off the screen and build it into their live performance. And so you saw a little bit in the clip there of um, them turning the projection screen into the sail um, so they, they had a, a moment in their performance where they wanted to be the, it's the, it's the Geats, it's the, it's the um, Norsemen coming down from, from Geatland, which is near kind of Stockholm. They came down into Denmark to save the, to save the um, locals from, from Grendel. And so there's a lot of, you know, uh, there's a lot of ships, a lot of ship talk, a lot of sea talk in, in the whole book, in the whole poem. Um, and so they wanted to, to have a screen, but they didn't want it to just be a, a straight screen, you know, they, so they turned it into a sail and things like that. So um, the participants were finding ways to do it. We weren't necessarily priming them to think this way between the, the spaces. They kept coming up with ways that they wanted to approach it, which was really interesting. And um, 
as I said, a lot richer, I think, than perhaps the straight, in different ways, than the straight game-based um, workshops. They had different kinds of outcomes. They probably got into the stories a little bit more deeply than, than we did in ours. There was a lot of building in ours. Um, a lot of chasing each other with dragon heads and um, hitting each other with sticks as well, which is you know, the fun side of drama, I guess. Thanks, Tracy. Any other questions? Anything else you'd like to tell us about, David, that you cut out of your presentation for time reasons? Um, Not to I put probably, you on the spot, sorry. No, <laughs> well, there's a, I have a whole other PowerPoint presentation um, about a completely different system. Uh, so um, it's a little bit dated now. So talking, talking about Mission Maker, but you can see it kind of stalled in towards the end of 2019. I can't imagine why. I don't know, I don't know why things would just go into a freeze moment at the end of 2019. Um, so we haven't had a chance to do much with it. We had, I did have uh, visions of doing some more stuff um, here at CSU actually with the Macbeth version of that. Um, around the same time, um, I and some of the colleagues who had worked on, on that workshop had turned our attention to a different system called um, Prospero. Um, another literature reference, reference to The Tempest, another Shakespeare play, but it's a completely different system um, developed by a drama and education company in the UK called uh, C&T. And theirs is a, it's a kind of rapid um, interactive tool that you can use to layer in game-like elements, if you like, um, over the top of existing web resources. So rather than being a, a game environment, a 3D game environment, it's a tool that works in a web browser um, to build in, to take existing web pages and other things on the web uh, and then layer in more dramatic elements over the top. So you can design uh, stuff that can be used in the classroom um, using a screen and, and um, the web browser as part of it. So it works with drama classes um, and others, but you can also design fully online um, activities. And so I started to turn my attention to that, uh, that software. Um, strangely enough, around about the same time as, as uh, uh, the start of the pandemic. So <laughs> I had a couple of projects in mind for that that have stalled as well. So maybe in the next uh, you know, year, um, might turn my attention to that. So I guess keep an, keep an, keep an ear out for that if, if uh, anything comes along. Um, I'd love to talk to people a little bit more about Prospero, um, it's a, but it's a completely different system. Um, and probably, you know, for in an educational setting, um, a lot of folk here might find it interesting in, in how that you might use it in your teaching. It's not tied specifically to drama and, uh, and games. It's, it's a way of building interactive um, moments, um, activities, if you like straight over the top of um, existing web resources. And so it has a wider application. So um, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't show you that, but uh, yeah, so there's, there's potential future research there, I guess. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much, David. Why don't we, uh, why don't we call it a day there? Really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Fascinating work there. I have to think about all those applications to other things. It's one of those things in there. It's when you see it, you just think, oh, you could do amazing things in all sorts of fields and areas with it. So thanks again, David. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, and I'll see you all at the next seminar, which I should say is Judy O'Connell uh, on the 27th of October. So see you all then. Great. Thanks, Thank Simon. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks, David. Cheers.